Yes, brother. What is the exact belief of the Buddhist? Uh, how, what are they in one God? They are believing or not? Brother, the question: What are the teachings of Buddhism? Do they believe in one God? That's what the question is. As far as Buddhism is concerned, if you read the teachings of Buddha, Buddha did not comment on God. Buddha said, "I count your Brahma one the unjust among." who made a world in which to shelter wrong. Buddha speaks of three divergent views that prevailed in his time. One of these was, whatever happiness or pain or neutral feeling this person experiences all that is due to the creation of a supreme deity. According to this view we are what we were willed to be by a creator. Our destinies rest entirely in his hands. Our fate is preordained by him. The supposed free will granted to his creation is obviously false. Criticizing this fatalistic view, the Buddha says, So, then, owing to the creation of a supreme deity men will become murderers, thieves, unchaste, liars, slanderers, abusive, babblers, covetous, malicious and perverse in view. Thus for those who fall back on the creation of a god as the essential reason, there is neither desire nor effort nor necessity to do this deed or abstain from that deed. Buddhism is an agnostic religion. Agnostic means neither does the person believe in God, neither does he deny God. The person who believes in God is called theist. Person who does not believe in God is called an atheist. But a person who is quiet, is silent on the existence of God, neither does he say there is God, neither does he say there is no God, he is called an agnostic. And Buddhism is an agnostic religion. Buddhism is an atheistic and an anti-theistic religion peacefully. Buddha explicitly rejected God whether in the form of a force or a being. Buddha, referring to the self-mortification of naked ascetics, remarks, if, O Bhikkhus, being experience pain and happiness as the result of God's creation, then certainly these naked ascetics must have been created by a wicked god, since they suffer such terrible pain. And the scholars of Buddhism they say that Buddha did not comment on God because when he came, polytheism was very much prevalent. And he thought that if he spoke about the oneness of Almighty God, people would not accept him. That is the reason he was silent. Neither did he say there was God, neither did he say there was no God. So he was quiet. But the scholars say that actually he believed in one God, but did not preach it because people would not agree with his teachings. There has been no scholar in the history of Buddhism who has said that people will not agree with his teachings if the Buddha spoke about the oneness of Almighty God. Further Buddha says, Believe nothing. No matter where you read it, or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Lord Buddha, enlightened one, do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Do not believe in anything simply because it is spoken and rumored by many. Do not believe in anything simply because it is found written in your religious books. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. Do not believe in traditions because they have been handed down for many generations. But after observation and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. People agreed with his teachings with logical reasoning and common sense. Buddha gave his followers an independent thinking view. Thus Zakir Naik is making his own generated false statement without any source. Buddha says foolishly, people pray for stones, trees gods etc. because of their fear for the unknown. Refuting the theory that everything is the creation of a supreme being, the Bodhis Atta states in the Mabadai Jataka, number 528. If there exists some Lord all-powerful to fulfill. In every creature bliss or woe, 
and action good or ill. That Lord is stained with sin. Man does but work his will. If the creator of the world entire, they call God, of every being be the Lord. Then an evil master is he. Knowing what's right did let wrong prevail. A young Brahmin called Vaisettha once went to see Gotama. This is the only straight path, he declared, the path of salvation that leads one who follows it to union with Brahma God, as is taught by Brahmin Pakharasati. Gotama asked him whether any Brahmin had ever seen Brahma, God, face to face. Since God is invisible and unknowable, Vaisettha was obliged to reply, No. In that case, countered Gotama, any claim about a path that leads to union with Brahma, God, must be groundless. Just as a file of blind men go on, clinging to each other, and the first one sees nothing, the middle sees nothing, and the last one sees nothing, so it is with the talk of these Brahmins. Their talk is laughable, mere words, empty and vain. Referring to the conversation with Baka Brahma, he says in that what is actually inconstant he calls constant. What is actually impermanent he calls permanent. What is actually non-eternal he calls eternal. What is actually partial he calls total. What is actually subject to falling away he calls not subject to falling away. Where one takes birth, ages, dies, falls away, and reappears, he says, for here one does not take birth, does not age, does not die, does not fall away, does not reappear. Neither in the sky nor in mid-ocean. Nor by entering into mountain clefts. Nowhere in the world is there a place. Where one will not be overcome by death. This is directly contradicting with God, heaven and hell. And as far as the basic teaching is concerned, Buddha spoke about the four great truths. The first great truth was, there is sorrow and misery in this world. When we get sick, we go to a doctor and ask, What's wrong with me? Why am I sick? What will cure me? What do I have to do get well? The Buddha is like a good doctor. First a good doctor diagnoses the illness. Next he finds out what has caused it. Then he decides what the cure is. Finally he prescribes the medicine or gives the treatment that will make the patient well again. The first noble truth. The illness. The truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, dissociation from the loved is suffering, not to get what one wants is suffering, in short the five categories affected by clinging are suffering. Birth, when we are born, we cry. Sickness, when we are sick, we are miserable. Old age, when we become old, we will have ache and pains and find it hard to get around. Death, none of us wants to die. We feel deep sorrow when someone dies. Second great truth. The cause of sorrow and misery is desire. The second noble truth. The diagnosis. There is an origin or cause of suffering. It is craving which renews being and is accompanied by relish and lust, relishing this and that, in other words, craving for sensual desires, craving for being, craving for non-being. But whereon does this craving arise and flourish? Wherever there is what seems lovable and gratifying, thereon it arises and flourishes. Third great truth, sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Third noble truth, the truth of the end of suffering, identifying a cure of the illness, the prognosis. To end suffering, one must cut off greed and ignorance. This means changing one's views and living in a more natural and peaceful way. It is like blowing out a candle. The flame of suffering is put out for good. And the fourth great truth was, desire can be removed by following the eightfold path. 
and the eightfold path says, do not tell a lie, do not rob, many of which are same as the teachings of Islam. Fourth Noble Truth The Prescription Path Leading to the End or Freeing of Suffering The Eightfold Paths One Right View the right way to think about life is to see the world through the eyes of the Buddha with wisdom and compassion. Two right thought. We are what we think. Clear and kind thoughts build good, strong characters. Three right speech. By speaking kind and helpful words, we are respected and trusted by everyone. Four right conduct. No matter what we say, others know us from the way we behave. Before we criticize others, we should first see what we do ourselves. 5. Right Livelihood This means choosing a job that does not hurt others. The Buddha said, do not earn your living by harming others. Do not seek happiness by making others unhappy. 6. Right Effort A worthwhile life means doing our best at all times and having good will toward others. This also means not wasting effort on things that harm ourselves and others. 7. Right Mindfulness This means being aware of our thoughts, words, and deeds. 8. Right Concentration Focus on one thought or object at a time. By doing this, we can be quiet and attain true peace of mind. But if we analyze the four great truths, of Buddha. If you analyze it with logic, the third great truth says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Okay, fine, we remove desire. Desire can be removed by following the eightfold parts. And to follow the eightfold parts, you should have a desire. So you have to have a desire to remove desire. Regarding this issue, one more Islamic scholar says. The eighth taraf to ye kaha jai ke khwaish. जो आपकी हैं या ख्वाहिशें जो आपकी हैं वो जो हैं जिम्मेदार हैं आपके मुसीबत के लिए और दूसरी तरफ कहा जाए कि इनको दूर करने के लिए आपको ख्वाहिश होनी चाहिए चार और आठ चीजों को अपनाने के लिए तो ख्वाहिश को मिटाने के लिए आपको ख्वाहिश होनी चाहिए ये एक सेल्फ कॉन्ट्रोडिक्ट्री बात दिस इज हिज आर्ग्यूमेंट वंस यू रिमूव डिजायर how can we follow the fourth noble truth that is follow the eightfold path unless we have a desire to follow the eightfold path? In short desire can only be removed by having a desire to follow the eightfold path. The Pali term Thanha, translated as desires, in the second truth is classified further in Buddhism to three as Desire for sensual pleasures equal lust. Desire for the continuous existence, can be compared with libido drive in Freudian psychology. Desire for the cessation of existence, can be compared with mortido or death instinct in Freudian psychology. If you add to these three the desire to remove desires as Dr. Zakir has used it, it is not the same as the above three desires, so the argument of Dr. Zakir becomes fallacious again. The term desire is used there to mean remove all those three desires. Follow the logic in his argument by following the logic in these two instances too. Regarding this issue one more misguided Islamic scholar Abdul Rahim says. Number one, I don't agree with the premise of Buddha. The premise of Buddha is that life is... The issue I have is number one. My first issue is this. There is suffering in life but is life suffering? That's wrong from the beginning to say life is suffering. There is suffering in life, but there is joy in life. There is happiness in life. It's the same as the fallacious approach of the atheist. There is so much evil in the world, but the, yeah, there's almost so much good in the world as well. So much good in the world as well, right? How come you only see the evil? How come you only see the suffering? So this is the first thing, the claim that there is suffering in life, as if that's all, no, there's suffering in life and there is ants in his wearing underwear. Then what he is supposed to do? Will the ants not make him suffer in his genital portion? Ants will bite him wherever the flesh is found. Either the person will dance or will run away. Still he will say that. How come I only see the suffering? How come I only see the evil in my underwear? How ridiculous. 
Still there is a joy in wearing underwear too. How come you only see the evil? How come you only see the suffering? So this Even Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fought for peoples because they were suffering as follows. 1. In Mecca daughters were buried alive. 2. Slaves were treated like animals. 3. People did not respect it woman. In Islam itself the greatest jihad is against oneself vanishing our own evils. So what did he fought for? Did he not fought for the removal of evil on the land of Arabia? Did he wanted the people to bury their daughters because it was considered as misfortune? Did he not fought for the woman who was naked by a Jewish tribe? Did he not condemn the suppression of women in society? Did he wanted the people to suffer? Then how this scholar can say that? How come you only see the evil? How come you only see the suffering? So this Even a child of five could understand the four noble truths of Buddha but this 40 and 80 year old man could not even practice it. Logic comes out of mind and they have no mind in fact. Father Buddha says. The Buddha did not deny that there is happiness in life, but he pointed out it does not last forever. Eventually everyone meets with some kind of suffering. He said. There is happiness in life. Happiness in friendship. Happiness of a family. Happiness in a healthy body and mind. But when one loses them, there is suffering. Thousands of candles can be lit from a single candle, and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. All wrongdoing arises because of mind. If mind is transformed can wrongdoing remain. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. The mind is everything. What we think we become. The mind is the source of happiness and unhappiness. Peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. One more Islamic scholar says that. <laughs> Buddha never said that he was a messenger of God or son of God. He was an enlightened one. Buddhists never refer after his name such as peace be upon him as Muslims refer to their prophets. He is the source of peace for us. He is himself a symbol of peace. Let's listen to some atheistic quotes. You're basically killing each other to see who's got the better imaginary friend. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? The fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one. Believing in a God is like a childish to me, Albert Einstein. When you understand why you dismiss all the other possible gods, you will understand why I dismiss yours. Stephen Roberts Give a man a fish and he will eat for a day, Teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime, give a man religion and he will die praying for a fish. The sailor does not pray for wind, he learns to sail. Gustav Lindborg God is infinite, an infinite amount of nonsense one can know about nothing. If you talk to God, you are praying. If God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. When did I realize I was God? Well, I was praying and I suddenly realized I was talking to myself. Peter O'Toole If hell were real, each occupant would be a shining reminder that God has failed. Robert Ingersoll That which can be asserted without evidence, can be dismissed without evidence. Christopher Hitchens I have never made but one prayer to God, a very short one, O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. And God granted it? Voltaire. The invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. Those, theists, who have understood or learned something from this video then you are wise to that extent. Otherwise go and ask your God that why did he make you saw this video.
please comment to express your free views. Thanks for watching this video and giving your valuable time. We care for you.